So here's the lecture for today, for the, the first lecture. So it's entitled Geomorphology and Geomorphic Markets. So the background of, of geomorphology that maybe many people already know, but it's important that we get some of these ideas uh, out there and have some definitions and think of some critical issues. And most of the figures are coming from the Tectonic Geomorphology textbook by Gervais and Anderson. So it's a very good book I recommend. And what I'll cover is the uh, climate and climate change over the quaternary. So this will, it's critical for developing the landforms that then may measure offsets. So that's why we also say markers. So we need something to measure as a false offset. Then we'll talk a little bit about landscape, fundamental landscape elements, hill slopes, and the channel network. And then I'll speak specifically about some Stream, some markers, so stream channels, marine terraces, and fluvial terraces. So first on climate change, so why we care is it modulates, so it means it makes, it drives the rate of formation of landforms and the kinds of landforms that we see. And this is over time and space also. So the, this definition, the climate, the long-term atmospheric and surface conditions that characterize a particular region and then weather is daily fluctuations in properties like temperature, wind speed, and precipitation at a point. So it's important distinction. Mostly we care about the climate. And the reason we care, this is an example for a river system, is you know, temperature and, and precipitation con, uh, control the kind of vegetation that's there, but also it influences the geology because of the um, weathering, so the ability to alter the materials, and then that runoff, the water, will influence the, the, the kind of uh, river flow, let's say, the ability to transport sediment, the kinds of sediments that are there, and then that in turn affects erosion and deposition, the shape of the stream channel, and the overall geometry of the landscape. So, so we have to understand climate and its effect on the landscape. So just a little bit global climate, you know, the, the main idea is that you have, it's, you have these cells of airflow, and this influences then also moisture in the atmosphere. So you start at the equator, this is a warmer place, so air rises, so it's low pressure, but because the air is rising, it cools, so it induces precipitation. So in the equatorial regions, we tend to get precipitation, uh, higher precipitation. And then this airflow rises to neutral buoyancy, goes to about 30 degrees latitude, and then there it's cooled enough that it comes down, so we have higher pressure, but as the air is coming down, it warms, and so it drives evaporation. And so we have lower precipitation, so that's why we see deserts at these 30, 30 degree bands on the Earth. And then same thing happens in high latitude at, uh, in the edge of the polar region. So, and then these are not, they're not circular. They, they kind of flow in like a, a helix, a spiral. So they move across the surface like these northwest trade winds or mid-latitude westerly. So these are important. This is why, you know, most of the examples I'm using in the, our class are from these 30 degree latitude, mostly desert environments, the challenge for you in Indonesia is that you're in the equatorial environment, so high precipitation, high vegetation, changes the ability of the landscape to record deformation. Other thing that happens, and we see this especially in uh, big mountain systems, is uh, this orographic precipitation. So as the airflow moves over topography, it may rise, it drives precipitation, and so on the leading edge of a mountain range, there will be maybe more precipitation and on the back side of the mountain range, which is we call rain shadow. And so this happens for a single mountain range, but it can also occur for plateaus, and we see even for example, Tibet being a high plateau, it pulls air in and it influences all of Asian airflow and climate. So just to show kind of global precipitation. This is just um, a nice kind of a movie here. So the color shows up to seven meters. So you see 
here in Indonesia is a very wet place. And then you go to these higher latitudes, especially this is a great example, North Africa. It's one of these places where you have this high pressure, low precip, low, uh, high evaporation. And so that's why the deserts are there. And then we come around. So uh, here in Western North America, where many examples I'm showing are desertic. The other thing that happens on top of the atmospheric flows is oceanic flows. And so this is why southeastern North America is wet because it has an oceanic current next to it that brings lots of, of water to the region. So this interaction between atmosphere and hydrosphere controls a lot of the geomorphic framework. So let's go back to this presentation. So the big thing then we have to always keep in mind when we're interpreting the landscape is climate change. And so this is showing basically delta O18. So this is a measure of evaporation in the ocean. And when the delta O18 is high, it's a warmer time. And when it's low, it's a colder time. So this is uh, the last 350,000 years. This is good zoom. This would be the 800,000 years and then last 2 million. So this is the quaternary, basically. You can say different definitions. The classical definition is 1.8 million years, but now there's some argument to change the definition of the quaternary to up to 2.3 million. But anyway, 2 million. And the reason why we care about the quaternary is it's the most recent time period. Um, but also it's a time period of high variation in climate, including as in the high latitude glaciation, but also we see large variation in sea level. And so this uh, this is important and it affects, it, it produces the markers that we may use as we study active tectonics. So in, in just some definitions, this last 350,000 years, the, these numbers here show these different stages of sort of key positions in the oxygen isotope curve, but really it's key temperature changes and also key sea level positions and even also key uh, glacial advances and retreats. So isotope stages are numbered backward, but the interglacial is odd. So we're in the between glacial uh, one, so we're also in high sea level time, right? Because when you have lots of glaciers, big ice sheets pull the water out of the ocean into the ice sheets lowers the sea level, and so on. So the usually these uh, big, uh, more even numbers are the excursions to cold times, and then the odd ones would be high sea level warm times. So uh, one of our big, basically we think of this time period between current time and this 5E as this most recent cycle of change of climate and so the 5E then is a time when also we see a lot of marine terraces that were produced. And so uh, when we speak about marine terraces and dating, this is what we're referring to. Are there any questions or comments? Maybe some people know about sea level change more than I do. Okay, so let's keep going. So somehow this network, uh, network is asking me for question. So here's the, this is the same plot, although it's reversed. So we're coming, you know, from 140,000 years ago to the present, basically uh, right to left. And this is relative sea level instead of delta 18. So you can see that right now we're the reference modern sea level is zero, but about 20,000 years ago, sea level was as much as 130 degrees meters lower. So major portions of the current uh, shelf were exposed and were terrestrial, but now they've been drowned. And the last time the sea level was this high was the 5E time, 120,000 years. Okay, so this uh, just is important, always keeping in mind this history. So any that that was just a quick thing about climate. Now I'm going to move to landscape geometry. So any questions or comments? Okay, so we just keep that in mind because the the point I've been making is that this variation in sea level variation in ice 
variation in precipitation drives the, the development of landforms and uh, we need to know it. So let's just talk about how the landscape's organized. So when you think of a of a any kind of topography and you put precipitation on it, it naturally focuses flow over the landscape and develops something called a catchment or a watershed. And so you have the main uh, river network or channel network is usually this tributary kind of uh, system. And between the river network uh, is the hill slope, so places where there's low amounts of water flow and other kinds of processes operating. And uh, these ridges between the channels are sometimes also called interflutes. And so the edge of the drainage network is a critical position. It's a place where there's, you know, when a raindrop falls, it can either go this way or that way. And so we define these watersheds as kind of a natural division of the landscape. So here's just looking at some topography, trying to take it apart. So this is a, actually, the San Andreas Fault actually goes right through the middle of it, but it's at the base of the slope. There's a fault scarf here. You don't see any offset, but it just shows it's a piece of, example piece of topography. And so the, the little uh, mounds here are plants. So this is actually from LIDAR topography. And there's some lines that are actually from uh, a little bit of an artifact in the LIDAR data gathering. But what you can see is you see the top of the hill coming around. So there's obviously basically the drainage divide. And then here's the main channel. So we can do some calculations with especially GIS systems and digital elevation models and, and analyze this topography. So one thing we can do is look at the contributing area. So this is uh, using, if you know ArcGIS, this is the Arc the Hydrology Toolbox. And what it does is it basically calculates for every pixel in the landscape how many cells are above it in the, in the sense of if the raindrop fell, we go down, 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 and then another one comes down, 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 and so a particular cell or piece of the landscape has so much area above it. And that area is called the contributing area. And usually it, we take the, the log base 10 of it because our, uh, the, the, otherwise it's kind of hard to see the color variation. But what this says is up high here, the very top of this channel network has a contributing area of 10 square meters. So very small, just like, you know, size of this open area here, rain falls on it and runs off and it starts to focus into the channel network. And then it goes down, 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 so that by the time we get to blue, we have, it's, we have, you know, it says 10, it's 3.9 is the log, so it's 10 to the fourth, right? So it's 10,000 square meters of area would be draining water when it rains into the channel here. And so this is a, a, a way to define the channel network. And as we move into tectonic geomorphology discussions, we'll show how we can use this uh, characterization of the landscape to look for indications of variation in rock uplift through the tectonics. So that's the channel network. So what's left is the hill slope. So this is everything else that's not a channel. And these are surfaces where there wouldn't be significant water flow and be more dominated the erosion or transport of mass would be by animal induced disturbances. So animals are walking and they're you know kicking material down the hill or vegetation plants are falling and they move material. And so it, the hill slopes do the initial transport of material and they hand it off to the drainage network. But as they hand it off, the way that the material moves changes to be more dominated by water flow. So this this difference here is uh, sorry. I wanted to just go between these two. Those are the if you want to describe geomorphology, those are the two pieces of the landscape. It's either hill slope or it's the fluvial system and the channel network. It's fundamental contrast and the difference. The point where these transition is sometimes they call the gully head. It's the 
top of the drainage network. It's very sensitive to climate change, to tectonic, how the drainages may erode in or come back down. So critical characterization. Very different processes dominate these two domains. And then here's just to chalk the topography to show the single watershed. And so sometimes, and my colleague, he likes to say that the drainage network is like the, the skeleton of the landscape. It holds, holds everything up. But then the hill slopes are like the flesh that are connected uh, uh, and around the, the skeleton, the bone. So again, just a key definition for us. And we'll come back to this, especially when we do tectonic geomorphology and also the fusion modeling of the landscape evolution will play around with uh, these ideas. So what you can you do with it, one thing you want to do is sometimes you can compute relief. And so there's different ways of defining relief, but now this is a cross section. So this would be a line if we came down from the top here, down through the drainage uh, to here, and, and we and, you know, we're looking straight up the drainage, but if we could rotate it on its side and look from the side, we would see this. So the main channel, the, the fluvial channel, the river channel is this line here, and it has some tributaries that come in and always have to join. And so this is basically elevation versus distance, so the longitudinal profile of the rivers. And there's different ways we can measure this relief. One is just the total relief in the river channel. So that's basically the maximum elevation minus the minimum. But we can also look at tributary relief and then even its hill slope relief. So in that case, it's just how much elevation is here above these tips. But what we'll show when we come into tectonic geomorphology is that the relief sometimes is a very good indicator of active uplift. And the reason is that if you're lifting the rocks, the main channel can keep cutting in, but the hill slopes just keep going up and up and up until we increase the distance between these two parts of the landscape. So that means that the valleys get very deep. And so the deepness of the valley in terms of topography indicates the tectonic. So we can come back to this, but just why this is sort of an uh, explanation of, of why we might care about this uh, description of the landscape. So any questions? Yeah. Usually, uh, well, <laughs> each one has different usefulness. So the hill slopes are often uh, more for studying small features, like fault scarps may, may be very small, like 10 meter size feature. And so it may be more influencing the local hill slope. But if you're looking at a whole uh, thrust system or a whole mountain belt, then you look at the drainage network. And so it's a kind of scale dependent, I would say. And so for larger scale, the, the drainage network is uh, uh, really indicative. And as you and I discussed yesterday and what you worked on for your master's, there are ways of looking at the shape of this profile that may tell us something about relative amounts of uplift, right? So we'll come back to this when we do tectonic geomorphology next week. We'll spend the whole lecture on studying. Basically, I like to show my hand is the longitudinal profile. So you can you can change how concave it is, right, like this. But you can also change the steepness, the constant concavity. And the steepness is very indicative of uplift rate. So if you can see a stream channel and, or can see a few and have similar properties, like going through the same rocks, the ones that are overall have higher steepness are probably in places with higher rock uplift rates, whereas if they're less steep, then they're maybe in relatively lower rock uplift conditions. And so these will, will play with this uh, trade-off in the coming lectures. Other questions?
Okay, so here is uh, so, so I don't know if this example always works that well, but when we talk about landscape development, areas of active deformation, we have some this idea, this equation, this just this series of, of thoughts. And what I've shown is is the topography from a computer model, so very simple. And and what we we want to say is, well, the current elevation is some complicated combination of what it was before, the original elevation, the tectonic displacement, what moved in the topography, and that's what we care about when we talk about active tectonics, and then the geomorphic displacements are the erosion and deposition. And that's our problem, right, is we have to see through the geomorphology. We don't really care about it. And what we might be really interested in is the tectonic displacement. And so in, a, in the desert, the geomorphic displacements are really low. They're almost zero. And so over time, it's easy to see, oh, yeah, so the current elevation is just the original elevation plus the tectonic displacements. But here, for example, in Java, the problem is you have high geomorphic displacements, right? Erosion, deposition, everything moving sediment all over the place. And the tectonic displacements are very small. We know they're there, but they're hidden and it's too hard to find. So this is our challenge. And so this is why I like to use this... Um, diagram to sort of separate and talk about geomorphic displacements versus the tectonic ones. And so this is this particular example is a stream channel. So it was originally straight across the fault. The earthquake moves it, but then over time it gets eroded, so sediment is moved from here into the valley and deposited. And so we see the current part of is it's more subdued. It's not so obvious exactly how these things connect. Whereas, with if this was, you know, where there was no geomorphic displacement, it would be very easy to map these two rectangles. Okay? So here's just adding some more words. So surface processes act to change the elevation directly through erosion and deposition. So that's the geomorphic displacement. While the tectonic processes push it down or lift it up or move it horizontally directly. So we're looking at these two together. And you can write it as an equation, simple kind of equation. But then the geomorphic markers are landscape elements for whose geomorphic displacement, erosion, and sedimentation are small enough or understandable and well enough that we can interpret the tectonic displacement. And so that's what a lot of this lecture is about, is the geomorphic markers. So here's the geomorphic marker. And this is, uh, Gayatri knows these guys very well. So this was, there was an earthquake in Southern California in 2010. It was called the El Mayor Cucupa. It was in Mexico, actually, not in the United States. The main shock was here, many aftershocks. So Gayatri, her master's uh, thesis work, she went to the university here in San Diego. Now she's you know, over here with me. But in this earthquake, it broke the ground, and so they went to the field. And immediately after the earthquake, you see, so this woman on the left, her name is Eulale Amasana, she's from Spain, and then this guy is named John Fletcher, who's a professor in Mexico. And so here we can see, it's hopefully quite clear, the original, the original form was this channel that went straight across the right? So that's the initial topography. Then the earthquake moved it, and that's the tectonic displacement. But because the earthquake was, you know, a few days before, there's zero geomorphic displacement. So it's easy to put this back together. And in this case, it was uh, an oblique flip, so it had some strike slip motion and some dip slip. So that's, uh, that's an easy one when there's a simple and this is why we always like to go see something. So any questions about this? Okay, so here's a longer one. So that was a single earthquake. Here is now, a, a, and I showed this ye uh, yesterday, but this is one of these famous geomorphic markers. So in this case, the San Andreas Fault is here, and this stream channel, so green, is higher topography, draining to lower, so you see this watershed here. So the watershed brings runoff down, 
but it used to go straight across the fault. And then over time, this side has moved by a repeated earthquake, displacing this marker and, and accumulating offset. And so in, um, I can show, here's the cartoon. So this is the famous work by Terry C. And uh, in his PhD, and then in a paper by C. and John. So they looked at the geomorphic markers as the first part of the story, but then they also had radiocarbon dating. So that's why we will talk about geochronology next week. And so they could date different parts of this landscape. And what they determined was about 19,000 years ago, there was an alluvial fan here dropping sediment. And the key point there is 19,000 years ago was that time of the Isotope stage two, so the wetter time in the Earth, and so that's probably why in this place the act, alluvial sand was active, just dumping sediment. But then as we have global warming from that time, the landscape behavior changed, and so it started to cut down. And also the fault kept having earthquakes, and so we exposed this fault scar about 13,000 years ago. About 10,000 years ago, one channel gets cut across the fault, but is offset to about 3,700 years ago. And then it's like one day it was here going through this channel, and the next day maybe there was a storm, some weather event, we cut a new one. And so this, we say, abandoned this channel, cut the new channel, is offset to the present. And so if you look at the topography, there's that 10,000-year-old channel. You can slide this guy back to here. Uh, and so, so that would be this time. And so then it was offset for uh, 6,300 years, accumulating offset until this position was straight across. And then as a storm occurs, cuts a new channel, abandons this one, and now we get to the modern uh, offset. So another really basic case where the geomorphic displacements are small. There's some modification. You see the, you know, sides of the valley are eroding in, and so they're modifying. It's not perfect. And if you remember yesterday, Mujik was asking, well, how do we get uncertainty when we reconstruct? Well, the uncertainty sometimes is because of the geomorphic displacements, the changes in the landscape after the offset begins, and and that we we can't do anything about. We just have to assess what's the range of possible reconstruction. So this this is the maybe the most famous offset channel in the world. So questions about this story? Yes, please. For this slide, it's more difficult because, so this is 130 meters here, so it's not one earthquake. It's probably maybe 20. But what you can see is you see this small step here, and also this small one here. So this is kind of the last earthquake. It's maybe about five to 10 meters from the base. And so we think these earthquakes here are, are big. They occur every 100 years or so. But it's only five meters, so it takes many earthquakes to build this offset. But what's important is that it shows that earthquakes are occurring always in the same place. You know, it's like it's predictable. It's not jumping anywhere. It's within just a few meter width, the rupture comes every time. So it shows this localization, the fault is weak, and it just stays there. So that's a good question. Okay, so good question. So the way it was done is, so the offset's easy, just measure and, and maybe have some uncertainty, but you get the distance. So that's, that's the, you know, the fraction, right? The distance over time. So the time comes, what they did was they dug trenches right here. And in the top of this channel, there was some sedimentation from the hill slope, but under that was fluvial sedimentation. And that fluvial sediment was the sediment that was in the offset channel that went to this one. And so the very top of the fluvial sedimentation here had two radiocarbon dates that were about 3,700 years. So what they assumed was that that's the last time there was deposition. 
in the channel, 3700. So the abandonment must have happened sometime after that. The other thing they did is you see right here, this little bench, we would call it, like a flat area. This flat location actually connects to this channel. And so they dug in here another trench, and it was also 3,700 years. So it shows basically that this time right here. So there was a terrace basically on the top here connected to this fluvial channel. And the sedimentation in here, like basically this day, was 3,700 years ago, the last sedimentation at the top of the accumulation. And then this incision and abandonment occurs, and it cuts down, and it leaves, it leaves this terrace remnant, and it leaves this old channel there. So that's how it was done. Yes. Okay, so the cart, this line back here, you don't see. The cartoon only goes to about middle of this flat fan. So behind, this is another mountain range called the Temblo Range, and you you can't see it. It's back back here because this is lidar topography that the airplane flew along the fault, but it didn't go too far to the side, so it just ends. The data ends. Good question. It, it is not active. Okay. Yeah, good question. But we can tell because although it's sharper topography, there's no no offsets that are systematic like this. So it may have been active at one time, but probably before 20,000 years ago. So this is what I was referring to yesterday, also that at this kind of 10,000 year time scale, the fault stays stable. But at maybe 100,000 year time scale, it jumps. So it's here for a while and then jumps to here. So this could be an old trace. But you can tell uh, pretty well by looking at the, the topography that there's no clear offsets on that second strand. So so the, what's measured on this is, is the entire budget. There's no secondary faults that are important. But it's a good question. And we must always check for a distributed deformation. And this is maybe a special case. This is really a plate boundary fault. So this is almost all of the plate boundary motion in just a few meters width. Okay, so let's look at another one nearby. This one I got to and I will work on next month. So this is a compact figure, so you have to look up here on the left, you see there's Wallace Creek again. That's the name of this lake, Wallace Creek. So up in Wallace Creek is here. And so the San Andreas comes down like this. And there's another place down here about uh, two kilometers. And this place is called Feeling Creek. And it's really spectacular because you can see uh, this may be a more complex figure, but what you can see is two channels come down like this. So the flow is from right to left. These two come down, and now they cross the fault with small offsets. But if you look up here, look at this. It's a, like a Y-shaped channel, and it matches exactly these, these guys here. If I cut it and I slide it back 230 meters, I can make the Y match the two channels. So you can see it also here without all the colors. See this Y, how it can connect there. Everyone see that? So, so here's a same kind of problem where we have the stream channels crossing the fault and they're active, but then they get abandoned. New channels start, offset and abandoned new channels. And so this has a complex story where there's this pair here matching at 230 meters of offset. The green one matches these guys 
it's similar as Wallace Creek, so about 130, 150 meters. So another reason why we care about climate is probably 3,700 years ago was a time when this part of California had big erosion events. And so it, it, you know, it caused new channels to be cut, and then they get offset the same amount. So that's uh, one thing we're starting to pursue is this climate control on the formation of these features. And then, what? Yeah, it's, it's, I don't exactly know, um, this is, these, you mean this is kind of a small channel here? Yeah. Well, maybe over time there's been some, uh, continued erosion, especially of this bigger one. The other one, other thing is that we, just as Mujib was saying, you know, we're just looking at the fault only now. And so upstream, maybe there's some changes going on that uh, earlier there was more that sort of even partitioning, even sharing of the runoff between the two channels. But now it looks like more runoff going into this southern channel, this big feeling creek. And so it's changed a little bit over time. Good observation. And so this place was worked on before, and, and so there's many trenches. This guys, they went out there in the 1990s, they dug 30 trenches, so all these things. <laughs> and so you can see how they're digging. They're digging across the fault, but also across the channel to try to characterize the sedimentary fill of the channel. But this work was never published. The person who was doing it was a USGS scientist, but he, he got another job, and so he just he just gave me a box and said, okay, you take it. Good luck. <laughs> so 20 years later, I still am working on it. But I'm hoping that... Uh, so what we did is we have some funding to go back and cut new trench blocks. Here you can see these, these uh, white ones. So they're on either side of the existing ones. And the idea is to, you know, the channel, we can see the landform, the, the geomorphology, we see the channel. But underneath, we can find the sedimentary fill of the channel if we cut with the backhoe. And so what we want to do is to cut and look at the stratigraphy in these channels and find datable material and build a kind of an age for the channel cut and then it's filling. And the work that was done in the 1990s, the radiocarbon dating wasn't very good. So the geometry and the... the Story, the geologic history is fine, but the geochronology is poor. So our new project is just to get new dates, and then we can finish the, re the research. And so we want to cut three channels, three trenches across the channels to just check, okay, do we see, you know, where's the best relationship? And the spot on the upper right shows why it's important. So this shows age on the lower axis versus offset. So Wallace Creek, this the main channel is sitting right here at thirty at you know thirty seven hundred years to hundred and thirty meters of offset. That's this one. And there's an older part of the Wallace Creek story. It's up here at about thirteen thousand and four hundred and fifty meters. That's the that's this incision here. It's kind of hard to see this fan. It's it's kind of hidden and in here you don't see the geomorphology of it. So Wallace Creek has a 13,000-year age and a 3,000-year age. So the proposal I wrote was to get an age somewhere between to check, is this slip rate relatively constant or does it change over time? And so we know the offset is pretty easy to say, Phelan Creek, this place, 230 meters, but how old is it? And so, you know, could this go like this and over or does it go up and over? So... You know, when you don't have much data, you just connect it with a line and you say, oh yeah, steady slip rate, no problem. But with more data, we might see more variation in rate. Okay. Question. Uh-huh. 
that so why only this one and this one remain? So yeah, go ahead. Maybe say so what. Yeah. Oh, well, because, so it's a good question, and it's a, sometimes we say it's a reference frame. So the way, way I think of this is keep this side of the fault is fixed. And so the river is just going like this, just yeah. flowing, and this side's moving. And so, uh, so these guys are fixed, but as we move these channels along, they are unstable to stay connected. And so at some point they get beheaded or abandoned. And then a new one gets formed. And then this one gets carried away. And then a new one gets formed and then offset. So this has three sets. It has this uh, this one here I call the Y channel. because It's like the letter Y, right? And then, uh, and then the, this green one, which was kind of looked like Wallace Creek. So it had a very clear along fault offset. This green would be kind of like, like this part or this part. But then it was abandoned. And so then the newest offset, newest channels, this one and this one cut down. But then they got offset a little bit. And so this offset here is uh, like 10 or 12 meters and this one's about 15. So it's, it's a, uh, you know, this sort of progressive channel formation offset abandonment. Formation, offset, abandonment. Keep going. And things can get even more complex because these, you know, look at this one way up here. So, it, you know, here's the Y. So this one goes a long ways. This could be, you know, 20,000 year old channel that formed here and it's just carried along. And then you think, oh, how about this one? But then by the time you get here, you don't see anymore. So the conditions may have changed that it wasn't making channels prior to some time. And maybe that was the 20,000 year old change in behavior. So at 20,000, 19,000 was more of a fan. And then we started cutting down everywhere. And that's when we start making these, these features. Now, but what you can imagine is perhaps this, these features, you know, in another 50,000 years, if things don't change, they'll be up here by Wallace Creek. And so Wallace Creek can use the old one and reoccupy. So this becomes quite complex when we make channels, abandon them, reoccupy them. So it's like if I have some clothes and I wear them for a while and then I put them over here and then somebody takes them and wears them, so I just keep moving through this. So good question. That was great. Shall we go a little bit more? Or another question? It's okay. Keep them coming. Yeah? Yeah. So, uh, say, say that one more time about the geomorphic marker, how, ask your question again, one more time. Uh, yes. Okay. Other markers, so I'll show. Another good one is, uh, marine terrace. So, so I'll show in a moment. So, Marine terraces show really vertical motion, not horizontal. But um, also uh, terraces. So fluvial terrace edge is another one I'll show. But anything can be used as long as you can, you, you know, you go back to this story here. What did it look like before? So in this case, it's something straight, a channel, but it can be a landslide or just a hill slope. So any marker is just something we can... This way, I say landscape elements. It can be anything, as long as we can understand, we can see through the geomorphic displacements and 
understand what happened to it. So let's look some more, and then maybe you'll you'll see what I'm saying. Okay, so back to sea level change. And so here's a, another kind of a marker, which is that when the if if you have the, the ground, the land is lifting, and sea level is going at about the same speed, the sea level is constant, and it's, it's the energy is going into the the beach, and so we get this point back here, this wave cut notch, this shoreline angle, any material that's unstable falls down and is eroded. And so this is a really a critical marker that tells us exactly where sea level was at that time. And so we can use it to, uh, I'll just show this first and I'll go back to the corals. So here's an example where these, these, these are beach ridges that are uh, more like, they would be some uh, sort of sand out here, a little bit easier to see, but there would be a back edge to it. So this is in New Zealand, and you can see these edges, and so they're forming, and here's a map of them, and what we can see is that the A, this A profile, the height between them are less than at B, and so this shows that the, the, the place is lifting, but it's also tilting, okay? And so this is uh, quite useful and is maybe more even useful here in Indonesia, where there's so many islands, right, so you can look for marine terraces. And I noticed in the, when we looked in the topography of southwest Java, there are these really nice terraces, it looks like. Did you go to visit them? And can, can you see them? Or? Yeah. So, uh, so, and so marine terraces are really useful in this sense, because we know they represent, you know, the ocean sea level at that time, and then they may be lifted up, and sea level stays here, cuts another one, lifts it out, keep going. And so there's some, uh, here's some older ones, these are in California, but you can see, here's the modern shoreline and modern edge of the marine terra, but here's an old one, and then here's an even older one, and there's even one here. And so as we pull the topography up, we, we lift these terraces out of the environment where they would be destroyed. And so if we can date them and we can relate them to the sea level curve, we can get an uplift rate. And so this is what we'll explore this in one of our uh, activities, but here would be the observation. So you see these, these terraces going up. And so this example here from California, this is the 5E. This is probably the uh, main 120,000 year old terrace here. There's another one there. So this is, you know, kind of like these few right in this area. And so we, we roughly may know their age. And then we can, determine the separation, the height separation with them really depends on the displacement rate, which is the rock uplift rate, because we have, these are forming in coordination with these sea level high stands. And so there's kind of a graphical way of, of connecting the sea level high stands with the strand lines. And you can imagine if the strand lines were further apart vertically, it would require a steeper slope which would mean higher rock uplift rate uh, of that uh, place, this landscape. Or if they're closer together, it means lower uplift rate. And if they're too close together, then you can't tell them apart. So sometimes, so this seems to work really best where you have really high uplift rate. And one of the most famous places is uh, Kulan Peninsula in Papua. It's a sort of really famous site for these marine terrorist studies. And this work was done by um, by Chapel, who's a, so if you look, I think this is, does it show here? No. So, so Chapel, he was an Australian uh, geomorphologist who really pioneered this kind of work. So any questions about the marine terraces? 
we can try to do an exercise and then in our activity. How do you gate? Yeah, so coral some, but it depends really on latitude. So a lot of high latitude ones don't have much coral. You know, if you're above about 40 degrees north latitude or below south latitude, you don't get coral too cold. So you can, but in tropical environments, you may see coral, and I'll show this in a moment. But a lot of this is oversimplified in the sense that there will be sediment here on this uh, surface, and so sometimes you can date with some shells will be embedded in there, uh, or even um, as soon as this lifts up and it's no longer in the in the water, then we get uh, like a beach, we get some sand and even some vegetation forming, and so if you can make an excavation into the old terrace and date just the sediments that first are above the oceanic or the marine ones, when you, you first show when it was lifted out, you can find maybe some organic material or because it's the sand, we can do gating with uh, optically stimulated luminescence. So I'll discuss this next week. Or sometimes people do cosmogenic gating on these. So they, you would say it's just a sedimentary package that covers the terrace. And you want to find the oldest age in that package because then it says it's closest to the time of abandonment. So this is done. Now for for uh, corals, which is uh, something here in uh, the tropical conditions, corals are really powerful. And maybe you may know more about this than I do, but the, the corals, they really are sensitive to, to their position relative to the uh, water level, right? They don't like to be out of the water, but they don't like to be too low below the sea surface. And so they track sea level quite well. So, you know, in this case, this shows a, a geometry of as the sea level's rising, which maybe the sea level's actually fixed, but the, the, the ground moves, the, the land moves down, then the corals will track. But also you can go the other way if the, if the sea level drops or the, the land moves up, then we, we basically erode into the old reefs and cut down, and the, the reef has to kind of be chased out and down to find a place where it, it can stay happy. And so, and the very nice thing, and this is why so much work has been done here, uh, in, especially in the Sumatran subduction zone and also Java subduction system, is the corals here are very well suited for tracking the sea level very detailed, and also they're easy to date. So, you guys must know, just in the hallways here are these slices of the coral. And this is uh, how, this is what they're for, right? And so there's much work done on this subject uh, here. So, any questions? So we'll do uh, an, one of our uh, afternoon demonstrations and exercises will be to use some data from corals to look at paleo Paleogeodesy. So the nice thing about the corals is they, they show the, both the kind of inner seismic, let's say, uh, you know, uplift of the, the land, landscape and then, uh, co-seismic subsidence. So we can get more of the, the, uh, story of what's happening due to the tectonic activity from corals than almost any other, uh, Indicator. So I remember maybe about 20 years ago, I was at a meeting with Professor Kerry C. And he said, why are you still working in California? There's no, no hope. You know, you can't really go, you can't answer questions about earthquakes there. You, you've done all you can. And so at the time, I, I, you know, I didn't know what to say. Uh, uh, you're right. Now, it, we have done better. We have done more in 20 years in California. But that's one reason why he... He was asking that because he said, well, I'm going to work, you know, in these environments with many colleagues because I can do more, I can do better because the, the data is higher quality. So, so let's keep going. Uh, 
any or any any questions? So the, the one example that is interesting for uh, these these beaches or and and wave cut platforms or marine terraces is sometimes it's good for lakes also, not just the ocean. And so this is a place in the. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see this map, but it's in. Uh, this is Salt Lake City, so it would be Western North America. And there was about uh, 13,000 years ago was a and climate again. The glaciers were melting that were on top of this mountain range here, which is called the Wasatch. And so as the glaciers melted, they put a lot of water into this basin. And there was a huge lake, and the lake was called Lake Bonneville. And it was there for maybe about a thousand years, but it was so deep, it pressed the crust down. So the isostatic effect of the water was enough to deform the crust. And so you can, you can go there and you can see like this old terrace on the cinder cone that's eroded into the side of the volcano. And this was studied even in the 1890s by a famous American geologist named G.K. Gilbert. And so he went around and he found all these terraces and he could show that they looked like they're about the same age because they had the same geomorphology, the same kind of uh, sharpness. And he just charted their elevation and their map. And so he made this contour map of the elevations of the terraces. So every time, you know, he went by one of these uh, mountains, which was an island in that lake, you know, the, the lake surface should have been horizontal, but now all of the as you go to the middle of the ancient lake, the terraces are higher. And so this is in, in feet. This is 5,000 feet, so it's like 1,600 meters or so. So what, what he showed was that the water was there, the lake surface was flat, then the water went away fairly abruptly, and the, the cut rebounded. And it lifted those terraces in the middle of the lake up. And so that's why the middle ones are higher. So this is a kind of really important tool for understanding the crustal kind of rheology. So the, the sort of isostatic response to load uh, can be done. Same thing happens in the high latitudes, like in uh, northern Europe, where there was big ice. Once the ice moved away, it lifts, lifts up these terraces. So we can use terraces for more than just uh, earthquakes, other kinds of ground motions. Okay, so other questions? Okay, so now let's come to the fluvial terraces. So in a river system, you know, my early part of my lecture was showing the watershed with the drainage basin, but once we come to the lower portion, we really may be transporting a lot of sediment. And so the, this basic geomorphic balance between the power of the stream which has capacity to erode versus the resisting power of the sediment and the bed of the channel. And so this is this kind of a cartoon of a scale from uh, the book that Burbank and Anderson. And so what they're showing is if you have more stream power, then it will pull this side down and this will cause erosion. But if you have more sediment, then it pulls this side down relative to the discharge, and we may have aggregation. And so this balance of stream powers with controlling incision or aggregation. And so it's this back and forth that's controlled by climate, because you can imagine the climate controls precipitation, which controls the stream discharge, but also it controls the ability of material to be produced that can be turned into the sediment that's moved in the river. So with this balance, then we see these kinds of terraces that are developed. This is a cross section in a cartoon, and it just shows that we may have cut a little valley, and then we fill up to like the top here to the the yellow. So it grades. So this was a time when uh, we had lower discharge relative to the sediment, and so we aggraded. So that would mean that we went up here, but then something happened. In other words, we maybe lost a supply of sediment or climate change. We cut down, we erode down here all the way to here. Then things change again, we fill back up to two. Then things change again, fill to three. So back and forth, this is what controls the development of these terraces. 
and they can be this we say aggregational so there's if there's sedimentation associated with it or degradational where it's no real sedimentation just a little lag of gravel just cuts down cuts down cuts down and so these can be paired or unpaired depending on their age as you move across the valley and so so this is a big question for geomorphology but these terraces are really good markers for us if they cross a fault or they can also, if they go over a fold, they can be warped. So here's another example of this uh, style of formation of terraces. So this would be just bedrock incision where we're cutting down and really not leaving much sediment, but we have these benches. So these are called strath terraces. There's not much sediment associated with them. Or there's this, you know, cutting and filling and then cutting and filling and we leave sediment in the valley. And so here's an example where you can see the sediment is draped over the top of the bedrock, which is this multicolored. So this may be more of the second case. So once you have the terrace, then you can, as I said, deform it. So here's a, a, a thrust fault system and the, the terrace, the one thing is we know it's the same age everywhere because of the geomorphic relationships that might be observed like this. So if you take like this first terrace, you can see it, the default crosses it. And so they map it. It's always let's say this T1 surface has about a nine, nine to seven meter high scarp. And here's the profile uh, of the geology underneath. But it's basically showing us this one surface. So you know, this is too big probably for a single earthquake. It's probably built in a couple of earthquakes, but it, so at least we could get a slip rate. If we know the fault geometry, we can say, well, how long does it take to get this much offset? So this is for dislip cases. And let's just go to uh, China for a moment. So the famous place for some fluvial terraces. So here, we are somewhere in here, right? Like one of these buildings? I don't know exactly the geography of that. So let's fly, flying out. Uh, my computer doesn't like these movies that much, but. So fly, there's Sunda system. So related to the Sunda system are these big strikes of faults of, of uh, Central Asia and including this one uh, right in here called the Alton Todd Fault. So this is one I have worked on a lot over the years. And it's in the desert, so it has good tectonic displacement record. And you can just see the fault trace, even in Google Earth, look at this. So this is uh, some debate about the slip rate, somewhere between 10 and 30 millimeters per year. But we can go down and here's an offset. And so what you want to see is the modern channel is here, but this edge matches to this one. Okay, so that's what we call a riser edge. So the terrace is the flat part, the tread, and then you go up the slope to the riser. And uh, so let me just make sure. Okay, so this, so the this line comes into the fault offsets to there, so we can define the displacement pretty well, but again, the question is how old is it? And so the, it's hard to date this slope itself, so usually we end up dating something about this surface here, the lower surface, or the higher one. And so there was some debate in the literature about what to do. And so there, this paper was written by uh, my colleague Eric Cogill, and so he had this very interesting cartoon, and he said, well, there's, you can either take this in mind of a lower terrace reconstruction or an upper terrace one. So basically, you start with the same shape. You have channel cut in, so the lower terrace, higher one, fault is here. So in this, uh, let's start with the upper one first, because it's a little bit easier to, to think of. It's just sitting there, we cut down, we accumulate offset, and, and nothing's really happening on the side here of the valley. And so the, uh, the total offset, which you can see here, this DO is the total observed riser displacement, is the, 
displacement of the upper tread after its abandonment, uh, but before this last incision. And, and so in this case, this offset here would, would be, would go with the upper terrace age. So we might have a hundred meters of offset, and let's say it was 10,000 years ago. So a hundred meters in 10,000 years, that's, uh, you know, uh, 10 meters in a thousand years, 10 millimeters a year. That's one way to get it. On the other hand, if you come down here, you could say, well, actually, even though it cut down, it still eroded. The, the channel went back and forth and it cut the riser and continued to refresh it. So, it, so there's missing offset. This erosion, you can't see that offset anymore. And so the offset that we have of the, the, uh, riser is smaller and the age we might use is the lower one. So in this case, maybe it's, you know, a few meters and a few thousand years. So we could get the same rate. But we have to be careful that we're dating and measuring the right thing. We have to understand this. And so he wrote this paper because there was a kind of a big battle uh, between him and some other scientists about which was the appropriate uh, model. And some of the other scientists were using this upper terrace reconstruction. And uh, no, no, they were using the lower one. And so they tended to used very low ages, but they had the large offset. So they came up with high slip rates. And so it was inconsistent with other data. And so he looked very carefully and he said, oh, well, actually, uh, you know, it's probably a lower offset and uh, maybe a higher age. And so the slip rate is lower. And so this was a it's really important, careful kind of thinking about how these, these things, these landforms work. So I'll just quickly show you again. So this, you know, as I said, the question is, see if I can get it to stop there. You know, did, was there, when this was incised, did, was there erosion here that continued, that continued to cut it and refresh it? Or as soon as it cut down, it never, never modified that. So, uh, this is this is an, uh, kind of showing the care that you have to take when you study these uh, markers. So, any questions?